My pun plants are here. So let me walk you through what I got and why. First off, I have my two oxygenators. All aquatic life, just like terrestrial life, requires oxygen. So oxygenating plants are the ones you want that are gonna get that oxygen into your water. This is especially important when you have a pond that doesn't have a pump, a filter or flowing water going into it, such as a fountain or other water feature. So I picked two plants for this. The first is this one. This one is, please excuse my Latin, Ceratophyllum demersum, also known as hornwort. And I'll get some out to show you. It's a very light, feathery plant, which has quite a large surface area, so also lots of little invertebrates will be able to shelter in it in the water. My second oxygenator is this one. This is Myriophyllum spicatum, <laughs> also known as spiked water milfoil. And it's been supplied for me in weighted bunches. I've got two in this jar. I'm trying not to drip it all over the kitchen table. But again, very feathery, very light, and this is going to add lots and lots of oxygen to my pond water. I talked about wanting to have my pond as another food producing space in the garden, and I've got two species in mind for that. The first one is Nilumbo nucifera, also known as lotus. These are very expensive to buy in the UK. Um, I only found one company that was sourcing ones that were guaranteed UK hardy, and they were about £40 each, and you had to go on a waiting list. So I'm going to take a chance with growing them from seeds. I've got the seeds here. They look kind of like little acorns. They have a point at one end and a little divot at the other. And you have to scarify them quite well before you sprout them in water. I've looked up instructions on how to do it, so hopefully that's gonna work. I want to grow lotus for the root, which is an ingredient in Japanese and Chinese cooking. It, you slice it lengthways and you end up with these strange little like wheel shapes. Um, they're delicious deep fried. I know everything's delicious deep fried, but they are delicious deep fried. And also a nice ingredient in hot pots or steamed in a bento box. So that's one food species I want to grow in my pond. And then this is the other one. It looks quite freaky. I'm, lo I'm loving this like biology lab vibe of having all my plants in jars. <laughs> this is oh my god it looks like some venomous snail or something this is sagittaria latifolia also known as wapato duck potato or arrowhead and it's native to north america and grows in ponds this tuber is edible obviously i'm not going to eat this one because i'm growing from it but hopefully i'll be able to cultivate a small patch of it and then eat those tubers. They're supposed to have like quite a nutty taste, sort of somewhere between a chestnut and a potato. So I'm really looking forward to trying them. I'm not too worried about having non-native plants in my pond because my pond is so isolated in terms of waterways. When I lived in Wales, our garden had a stream running through it and there was a pond that came off that stream and then water flowed out the other side of that pond. I would not recommend non-native species for a pond like that because there is the risk of them going invasive, but in a garden like mine, in a generally dry area where there isn't inflow and outflow of waters into other water sources, it should be okay. Then I have two picks just purely as wildlife plants for my pond. One of them is a native. Ranunculus lingua grandiflora. It's dripping everywhere. <laughs> this is great spearwort. At the moment, it's just got these lovely feather shaped leaves, but it will put out flowers like a buttercup. Ranunculus is the buttercup genus. 
and those flowers will attract pollinators. They're great for beneficial insects like hoverflies, which eat green flies, and it just looks beautiful. This will flower hopefully in a couple of months. It flowers around May time. And in addition to the flowers, the stems will provide a sheltering point for invertebrates in my pond. And then lastly, I have one more non-native, Acorus graminaeus ogon, or Japanese golden striped rush. It's got these long grassy style stems and I chose this because it was a dwarf rush so it's not going to overwhelm my pond. And these stems again, this shape is great for invertebrates. Things like dragonfly and damselfly nymphs will attach to the base of these under the water. This is a marginal so I'll have it on a shallow shelf in the pond so most about a third of the stem will be below the water, those dragonfly nymphs will be able to attach onto them and other invertebrates will be able to hide among them. So those are my picks for my pond plants. I'm going to plant my pond up today, let it settle in for a little while and make sure I finish off this video with some footage of it once it's been there for about a week. One more pond plant came in the post today. I've had it here in a floating bowl of water while I've been at work. Stratiotes aloides, I think is how you pronounce it. Its common name is the water soldier and it's native to the UK. It was originally from Norfolk, Suffolk, the broads and fens of Norfolk and Suffolk. And it's a great plant to have in a wildlife pond because it's great for supporting dragonflies and damselflies. There's specific species that need plants like this for their nymphs to survive. So that's the baby dragonflies and the baby damselflies. So hopefully uh, this is gonna perk up a little bit more <laughs> when I get it in my pond and it'll encourage those dragonflies, those damselflies, predatory insects that are gonna help get rid of black fly, green fly and other naughty little pests in my garden. It's been about a week, so let's check in and see what our pond plants are doing. Starting with my lotus seeds. So to get these guys germinated, I had to scarify the ends of the seeds and then soak them in water and keep them at about 21 degrees C. I've had fairly good results with these. Three out of my five seeds germinated. Let me just grab one for you and show you what they look like. So they've got a beautiful long stem coming out here. You can see the seed has split from the end where I scarified it. So one of these I'm going to plant in a basket and put in my pond, but I think my pond might be a little too cold and too dark for them to properly develop edible roots because I read that lotus needs a good eight or so hours of sunlight a day to flower and develop edible roots. So I'm planning to also get a little half barrel to go in my greenhouse where they'll be kept warmer and get a little more light. Heading down to the pond itself, what can we see? So obviously here's our golden Japanese rush. That seems to have perked up quite nicely having had some time in the pond. Down here it is hard to see. <laughs> So I will mark this out for you with annotations. Down there, you might be able to see something that looks like a weird little, kind of like, almost snail horns. That's my wapato, my duck potato, my arrowhead, my Sagittaria latifolia, whatever you want to call it. I've planted that into a mesh basket so that it can thrive along this edge. It's on one of my pond shelves. Over on this side of the pond, well, you can see we've still got we've got the log to help animals get in and out. I would hate for a hedgehog or anything to drown if it fell in the pond. And just beside the log here, it's hard to see because of reflections, but there's a clump of hornwort. And this is doing really nicely. It seems to have taken off quite well, the few bits of it that I can see. I can also see, but I don't know if you can, there is some spiked water milfoil which I tucked into the edge of the bricks that my gnome sits on. Here's my gnome. 
my meditating gnome, Namaste. Unfortunately, a bird has plopped on him. On this edge here, you can see my great spearwort. I divided the clump into two. There was about four plants within the clump, but I divided it into two. So they're gonna take over over there and over here, hopefully. This will make beautiful, delicate yellow flowers that are gonna help attract insects to my pond. One thing I can't see is my floating water soldier. So I don't know what's happened to that. I don't know if at this time of year, maybe they sink a little lower and then it will pop back up. Hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, obviously this pond is in its infancy. It's gonna take a little while to get established. But well, every pond has to start somewhere and this is where this one started. I might introduce more plants in the future, especially marginals for the boggy edge of the pond. I'm thinking maybe some marsh marigold, some yellow flag iris, maybe some calla lilies. I'm quite into the idea of having beautiful flowering pond plants. So it's sort of a cross between a flower bed and a pond. Anyway, the weather is not so good today and it's windy and noisy and planes keep flying over so I'm going to leave it there for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed seeing my pond journey from a hole in the ground to what we have here. Stay tuned. Uh, if you want to subscribe, that's great. I put out a garden vlog called Lay of the Land. You can check out playlists of those on my page that's basically just checking in with my garden once a month or so and showing you how things have changed, how things have transformed. So if you want to keep up to date on this pond and watch it change over the months, that's a good thing to do. Check into Lay of the Land. Okay, I'm going to leave it here. Take care. Bye bye.